Welcome to the second episode of the Guitar Power Hour, sponsored by Rock Life Music Academy with me, your host, Alex Bacha. Today's guest is Dave Lizio, formerly of the metal band Nonpoint. Dave parted ways from the band about a year or so ago and is now living in Denver, Colorado. I'm pretty excited about this one because Dave and I are both from Crystal Lake, Illinois. I was friends with his younger brother in school, and after high school is when I actually met Dave, as he would often come over to my friend's house for parties and just to hang out and such. Uh, We did this interview at Dave's house, and I appreciate him and his wife opening up their home to do this. Uh, We talked about a lot of great stuff, so I hope you learned some interesting things and have fun listening. Let's get to it. So I'm here with uh, Dave Lizio, formerly of Nonpoint, now living in uh, Denver, Colorado area, which this is actually Denver still. Technically, this is a Denver mailing address, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Weird, because so. it's like, must be like this yeah. one weird peninsula right. of Denver going up it's, north. Yeah, it's weird. Something. Basically, if I it's fart, you can smell it in yeah. Thornton. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's yeah. pretty much where I live. So, interesting way of looking at it. Uh, <laughs> that also depends on what I had for dinner. But. Yeah. Uh, usually have too many wrong things for dinner in that regard. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that's my daughter. She's yeah, two. Yeah, we're at, we're at his, uh, his <laughs> place here. Um, and uh, get, going back to the very beginning then, sure. what, what, what was the story with you getting started with the guitar? Um, well, it's, see, I started playing, as far as I, as, as far as I can remember, I started playing when I was eight years old. Um, but I really wasn't like playing aggressively. It was just I. It's kind of a long story without dragging it out too much. But I grew up with um, this old Guild acoustic guitar in the house, and That's what I play now. Okay, yeah, it was a 1974 Guild F50. Yeah, it's not a 1970s, but no. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know that at the time. I just knew it was a guitar. It's probably pretty nice then, actually. And. You know, on, on the walls, my dad had these gold records on the walls. Yeah, I, I never knew what, what, what that was all about. Yeah, until I was old enough to start talking, and it turns out my dad, uh, he was an engineer at Motown Studios for a long time, and through the process of working with a lot of big Motown names, he also um, worked with Smokey Robinson, and they became best friends. So my dad ended up leaving the production side of the business uh, to go into the live production side of the business. And so he did a lot of work with Smokey Robinson. They were basically inseparable for about five years. Really? Yeah, I didn't know much about it. I just knew that Jacob told me that. Yeah. Yeah, he did the, he did the whole Where There's Smoke album, and then he did that the single Cruisin'. He did that with Smokey, and they just kind of hit it off and um, went off and did their own thing afterwards, you know? After I was born, I guess my dad came back from tour, and I was like, I was like nine months old or something. He came back from some long tour in Europe. And when he went to pick me up at the airport, I didn't recognize who he was. I started screaming and kicking, and so he just, he's like, that's it. You know, I got to do something else. And so, yeah, so, you know, obviously he found other work. Um, But that was really all that I saw growing up was just these these two records on the wall, and there was this guitar, and I didn't know there was any correlation between the two, but there was. (laughs) And that was his guitar. He had it for a long time. So I just wanted to play it. So my mom, she was also a musician. She used to, you know, sing and write music and all sorts of, you know, artsy crap like that. And she taught me a couple Beatles songs. She taught me how to play Blackbird. It was actually the first song I ever learned how to play a guitar was Blackbird. And um, Mother Nature's Son, uh, some of the some of the music off a of revolver, I want to say, you know. And so I learned a few Beatles songs, and that was it. And I played those two same songs for, I don't know, eight or nine years probably. <laughs> uh, it was it was a while, but um, yeah. Moving forward, I didn't really I didn't really get back into music at all until I started. Uh, I stumbled across this band called Nine Inch Nails. Oh really? And Nine Inch Nails. That's one of my first favorite bands, actually. <laughs> Chain, dude, that changed everything. For yeah, me. yeah, and it was it was weird because I was you know raised in a very religious household, but um, either way, I didn't listen to a whole lot of you know music beyond music that my parents listened to, which was lots of oldies and old Motown and stuff like that. Anyway, so that's kind of what I grew up on, um, and then you know whatever is on the radio. Yeah, but then I heard this. I heard this Nine Inch Nails band, and I'm like, what is going on here? This is like so creepy so and scary and like. I'd never heard music that really struck, made me feel something like that. Where did that come from? Where did you first hear it? A radio? I don't even, it had to be one of my friends or something Mm -hmm. like that, you know, but it was head like a hole. 
And I just remember thinking, this is cool, man, you know? And so, and so somebody gave me Pretty Hate Machine, and I went home and listened to it, and I just thought this was like the most, that was the most incredible, like, musical experience of my life at that point, you know? And, and I was probably in like, <laughs> I don't know, eighth grade at this point. Like, I didn't care about music at all until way late. Um, but that was a neat thing. And so I started, like, looking for other music to make me, that, that kind of sounded like meaner and scarier like right. that. And oddly enough, I kind of went a different direction. I got into bands like The Offspring and Nirvana, which fortunately were very easy bands to learn how to play music to. But I decided I wanted to start playing music. So I think, I think the first album that I really decided to sit down and learn was Nirvana's Nevermind. And fortunately, that was a great one to pick because it was awesome for beginner guitar, you know. You're still and playing that guitar, that guild at this time? What's that? No, at this at, at this point, yeah, I started learning stuff on the guild and you know, I just kind of hunkered down and I begged my mom for, you know, a couple bucks and so we went to a we went to a resale shop and she got a this little white like Kmart electric guitar with a humbucker in it and um I think we spent like a hundred dollars for a PV Rage 158, little, little eight inch, 15 watt solid state POS. I still have my first amp actually, mm -hmm. just a crate. But then, like I said, I get into these other bands and I started playing music. And after I had pretty much, you know, got the Nevermind album down, I started, you know, trying to find other things that were a little more hard to play. I started having fun challenging myself. And I, like, I'm like a freshman now at this point, you know. Okay. So I'm, <laughs> yeah, I. That was really when I started really learning how to play was when I was a freshman. Okay. So uh, I remember being at this carnival and I was on one of those, you know, whip you around and make you puke rides. And there was this song in the background that just sounded so nasty and pissed off and it was all guitars. And I was thinking, man, this is freaking awesome. So I, uh, I get out of it, I got off the ride and I asked the dude that was running, I'm like, what's the name of the band that was playing in there? He's like, oh, that's Metallica, man. I said, what's the name of that song? He's like, it's called Through the Never. And I'm like, I gotta remember that. And so uh, that's that was when that was when things really changed. I bought the Black Album and shit myself. <laughs> Stupid. That was like the most incredible experience for me ever. And that was the next album that I learned front to back was a Black Album. So along this way, with, as far as the practicing goes, you were pretty much just trying to learn the songs. Mm -hmm. But what about when it came to like the technical aspect? You know, techniques, just left hand, right hand, just being able to use them, be comfortable. The okay, so there was no there was no technique at all. Um, it was again everything I learned, everything I know about playing guitar. I pretty much learned through Metallica. Albums. I still think James Hetfield was probably one of the best rhythm guitarists ever to grace this planet, and just playing along with those old albums like Master of Puppets and Injustice for All for two years. Once I found those albums. That was my practice. Every day after high school, I would go home and I would put one of those albums in and just play it front to back. You know, play along with it. You know, I obviously had to learn the songs first, but once I had them down, that was what I was doing. Because I was just playing the, the albums back to front. And um, after about two years of ripping through old Metallica, my left and my right hand were pretty well coordinated. Did you come up? Did you face certain <laughs> issues though along the way where you were like struggling with this particular type of thing, and you did have to kind of hunker down and practice that certain thing? I would hunker down and practice certain parts over and over again until until I got them down. So inevitably, you were kind of working a technique without realizing it in a way. Pretty much, yeah. It's, I mean, you, you do anything, like. A, it's kind of like an old, you know, martial art concept, I guess, too. But it's like, you know, you kick the bag a thousand times. Why? Because by the thousandth time, your your body is going to be doing it much more efficiently than the first time. Right, right. You know, you're just gonna it's gonna learn what to do to get the most energy out of it while exerting the least energy doing it. And I, I guess that's kind of the same idea. So that approach was just sit down, repeat, 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 yeah. repeat until it until you were satisfied. Yeah, but I was yeah, but I wasn't doing it. I wasn't practicing to get good at it. I was practicing because I was having fun. I was having fun being able to play these things. It yeah. was just fun for me, and that was really that was really it. The only reason that I became even remotely proficient with the guitar was because I was playing music I wanted to play. Right. You know, if someone had sat me down and said, "Okay, learn these notes, learn these scales, learn these <laughs> modes, learn these chords, learn all this crap," I probably never would have wanted to because it was just being forced on me. Yeah. You know. By the way, when you were learning songs, did you have some sort of music book? No. 
no tablature no. or nothing, just I, listening by ear? I didn't learn about tablature until probably two or three years into really seriously playing guitar. Okay. Um, and I still have no clue how to read music. I don't know anything Probably. about modes or notes or chords. So you just listen and just figure it out? Yeah, okay. you know? The only thing that I've done even remotely different is that I, I, don't, I don't play in standard E anymore, you know? Right, I just is drop tuning. I, I love drop tuning, not as a crutch, but because, I mean, anyone, you know, I mean, whatever. You just approach it different. Yeah, it, it's just, I have more fun with it. Yeah. I, 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 I write more diverse music when I'm playing drop tuning. So, did you do the drop tuning at that time at all? No, the first time I ever played drop anything was after I joined my first band, and that was it. And it was because a lot of their songs were in drop C. And that's, so, that's a little further down the road from yeah. early freshman year, right? Oh, yeah. So then for that, learning the Metallica and the Nirvana and stuff, like... No, obviously you, Metallica led to Anthrax, which led to... Well, the you know, Metallica, obviously, much more challenging than Nirvana. I, I'm just thinking about my learning experience with Metallica, and I really had to, I had to have the book at a certain point. There were some times I learned things by ear, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think naturally, because I was taking lessons, there were certain things that I learned, so I just naturally approached it differently. You know, it was normal for me to open up a book and try and learn Metallica. But I try and look at it like, man, if I try to do this all by ear, mm -hmm. that, I, I, I have no idea where I would have been with <laughs> it, you know? So that to me seems really challenging. And like, I'm thinking about, I wouldn't even necessarily have known, like, as far as, like, hammer-on or pull-off. Um, and I'm sure sometimes you maybe weren't 100% sure if what you were doing was oh, to yeah. the detail exact, but it still sounded the same, yeah. right? So, but then what about with those techniques? Like, where did you learn those techniques? How did you pick up on those? And how did you know if you were doing them right? Well, I don't, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know if it was from watching other music videos or just watching things on TV or, or just it's just... accidentally doing it one time and you're like, oh, that makes sense. I don't know. I think it kind of came naturally. I didn't, I don't know that I was, I don't know that when I first got into it, if I was able to hear the difference between like a hammer on or a pull off or, or if someone was picking through something or just, you know, legato playing. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely started off, well, I, when I got into leads, one, that was the thing. I started getting into playing lead eventually. I got kind of bored of just doing the rhythm thing, and so I wanted to learn how to how to play leads. And then I was like, "Wow, this is way harder than just playing rhythm on, on a lot of ways too." You know, so and I. And you were learning the leads by ear too. Yeah. Um, that would be even harder, man. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing, though. I, I'm not Kirk Hammett. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I can I can play lead guitar, but I can't play like that. I'm not that good. You know, so I I know I knew hundreds of Metallica. I mean, literally at one point. And I was not that far. I think I was still in high school. I knew how to play Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning, Master, Puppets, Justice, the Black Album, uh, both Load and Reload. I knew how to play those albums front to back. I mean, Metallica was my band, you know, but I didn't know any of the leads. And that was when I really started getting into it was after I... Um, and that was, that was a lot more difficult. So what point was this? Was this like... Sophomore year? Is it still freshman year, or is it later in high school? Or? This is probably senior year. Senior. I really started getting into playing lead. Okay, I'm gonna say. And um, and then at that point, were you, did you know, how to read tabs, and were you using that? Yeah. Or still doing it by ear. And that's that's probably when I discovered tablature. I would bet. I mean, I don't really know. I never, you know, marked it on a calendar yeah. or anything like that. But if I had to guess, I probably discovered tablature because I was trying to learn how to play these leads online. And that, that was probably what led me to tabs. Okay. Um, what sort of things did you find that you particularly struggled with? Were there anything in particular? Leads. It, 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 that is just lead in general. I still think that is far and away my weakest thing. I mean, I can, I can, it was, <laughs> it was weird. It was, it was one of the most unexpected compliments I've ever received in my life. And I still really can't, can't believe that I got it. But, and you know, again, I guess you could credit I, I would credit Mr. Heffield for this because I knew the guy downpicked basically everything, and so I got really good at downpicking. And um, for whatever reason, that made me an accurate guitar player as far as timing goes. And I remember the first time in the studio with uh, with Nonpoint. You know, this is I'm, I'm working with Johnny K. You know, this, this is a big name. He did Disturbed. He did you know he did all these all these bands. Um, and did very well for them. And when I was tracking, you know, you, you have to double track and quad track a lot of things. I remember tracking these parts, and he was looking at the screen, and he looked back at me at one point, and he was like, he's like, that is some, he's like, that's some damn good guitar playing there. 
and that's this guy saying that. And I was like, I, I didn't know what he meant because it was a really simple riff. Right. You know, I'm like, well, there's not really, I said, I'm not really playing anything complicated. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he's like, but you're making my life really easy. He's like, there's nothing here to edit. You know, he's like, there's very little to edit. Because right. I mean, just so everyone knows <laughs> if you're not listening or if you are listening, everything you hear on the radio today is edited into oblivion. Yeah. Even if it's recorded to tape, it is punched out digitally afterwards and run right through Pro Tools or whatever they're using and it is edited into into oblivion. Yeah, so drums are hard to even reel these days. Yeah, yeah, they, they time align drums. I mean it's not that you know our recording sounded bad before everything was edited, but it's just the nature of the beast right. these days. That's just the, the competitive you know? edge of the polished sound and stuff. Yeah, so but I mean he was he was showing me, you know, the 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 four tracks that I had played lined up on top of each other and all of all of my picks were within about two hundredths of a second of each other. Um and I guess all of that, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand at the time because I didn't really know anything about recording either. Uh, but I guess that was a good thing. He said that, um, and then his engineer uh, said that I was the tightest, I was the tightest guitar player he'd ever tracked. You know, and I, I felt pretty cool about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's always a, always a hard thing, man. That's something I still have to make a point to think about myself. But on the other hand, though, I still feel like I'm a very weak lead guitar player. I know I know a few little tricks that I learned here and there, and I got good at doing, and I basically just pour them out like crazy on my recordings. You well, know? you know, bringing back that that kick yeah. analogy you're talking about, Bruce Lee says, you know, who's who's to be more feared? Something I'm paraphrasing, but you know, uh, the guy who's done a thousand kicks one time or one kick a thousand times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. That's, that's kind of you're the one kick a thousand. Times yeah. yeah, I got a couple kicks, but I know I know when to throw them. You yeah, know? exactly, exactly. No, not that one. Um, so then, uh, what else was going on in high school with the guitar? You didn't do bands no. until after high school. You said right. Well, yeah, and it's kind of funny too because I there was a period of time where I just stopped playing. I was I was big into guitar when I was uh, in high school, and then. Um, you know, my mom, she moved to Vegas, my dad had his own life going on, and I was basically living on my own shortly after high school. So either way, you know, I, I, I started working at the dealership, I started working in Barrington as, as, a, as a technician, and I just stopped playing guitar. I, I, I put the guitar down in 2001, and I really didn't pick it up again for years. I mean, it was probably... Try one more time, it's free. It was probably about six, five or six years, because in 2007, I set foot, I remember I walked into Dr. Wood's Guitar Emporium right there in the Fox River Grove, um, and they had this ESP, it was an LTD F400 on the wall, and I just looked at that and I'm like, that's kind of a cool looking guitar, and I picked it up and I played it, and I remember thinking that was the most comfortable guitar I'd ever felt in my life. And um, I still have that one? Yeah, I actually have, well, here's the thing. I liked that one, but I didn't like the color on it. And I said, well, what other colors are available on this? And there was a flat black one. And it came with EMG 81s, uh, which I'd never had a guitar with active pickups in it before. And I was like, that's awesome. And it just, dude, the thing played awesome. And so it gave me a reason to start playing again. So I started, I started playing, and you know, times had changed now. So I was listening to new music, and I started learning how to play a lot of the music off of All That Remains, uh, The Fall of Ideals, that album. Um, which was a big kick in the ass for me because I hadn't played in so long I didn't realize how far my my right hand had deteriorated yeah. and that album is a lot harder to play than anything Metallica ever recorded really? <laughs> oh yeah what ways would you say it was like harder was it it's just it's way more technical far more technical much more involved much more it was just faster meaner harder to play you know stranger chords more involved it was it was great for me to practice on because it was like uh yeah, I don't know, it was just awesome it was like modern it was like modern thrash you know that that album it's much that same approach with like learning by ear yeah yeah i mean that album really uh revolutionized a lot of things for me there were a bunch of bands in my history that were that are very important to me you know all that remains is one of them and it was because of that album nothing against what they've done before or after because i like a lot of their stuff i'm just style with that they're a metal band death metal or metal core maybe i don't know man i don't know where i don't know that's really hard for me to keep track of it i'm just thinking like it just helps me kind of get a general gauge oh yeah that's uh yes southeastern Braised, braised beef metal. Yeah, I've had that before. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 if you've never listened to the Fall of Ideals, give it a listen. It is 
probably it is if it's not on everyone's top ten best metal albums of of that decade, then they need to listen to it more. Yeah, doing that by ear then at that point, I mean, were there things that like whether did they use? And I don't know how much you knew about it at the time or anything, or if you remember now looking back on it, were there things like odd time signatures? Yeah, or like, stuff yeah, like that. They were definitely well, you know, Metallica used a lot of odd times back in the day, so that's kind of yeah. It, it, it was hunting for more music like that that led me into bands like Dream Theater and. I, I'm just thinking for myself, like I would. I struggled with that if I did not understand that time signatures first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, there's a lot of it. Like, I'll tell you what, one of my favorite bands in the world is Meshuggah. Yeah. I am an enormous Meshuggah fan. Like, stupid. And I remember one of my buddies um, was telling me about this band. He's like, if you like technical music, he's like, you gotta listen to this band, Meshuggah. He's like, they're really heavy. He's like, but they're really technical. And I remember thinking, okay, I can get into this. But this was before I got in. This was probably 2000. Two. It was 2002. No, it was 2003. He's like, yeah, they got a new album out. It's really good. Um, and so, yeah, okay, yeah, that was exactly it. So I remember buying it. I bought this album called Nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I was interested in it was because it was the new album, and it was like the first time I'd ever heard of an eight-string guitar. I'm like, what the hell do you need eight strings for? So I was expecting like really spectacular sounding chords. You know, and I and I wasn't into really screamy heavy metal, you know, but at that point either. Um, I was just kind of starting to break into that that kind of music. You know, yeah. Pantera was about as, as as screamy as it got for me. Yeah. And um, you know, that can't be though, because I was listening to Extol before then too. Either way, I bought this Meshuggah album, and I remember listening to it once and thinking that it sucked. I'm like, what the hell did I just listen to? Nothing makes sense. I can't yeah. follow any of this. The vocals blow. <laughs> And I, I just, I, so it ended up in the back of my car. And about uh, probably a year later, I ended up cleaning my car out and I found this CD and I couldn't remember anything about it. I'm like, what the hell? What was this? And I played it again a year later and it just made sense to me. And like my, my music had, what I had listening to had progressed so much over the last year that all of a sudden Meshuggah made sense to me. And it was like incredible. I'm like, look, there's, there's these different, you know, there's these different meters going on at the same time and the drummer blew me away and I finally understood how to listen to that band. Now, were you so, able to comprehend that stuff? Like, I know that you say that you don't know much about, like, theory and stuff. Yeah. But were you able to kind of know, like, this is a five, eight time or no. something? Or All I knew is that the drums were doing one thing and the guitars and the kick drums were doing something else. And, and I thought, lined up and it always way. lined up in the end. And I was just doing, it was just numbers in my head. Like, this thing would play seven times over the same time that this plays five times. And so, in a way, you were still thinking about it in that way. You yeah. just didn't necessarily learn about that. You just kind of came across your own way, created your own language for it in a sense. Yeah, I, I was just counting. You know, I just figured that in this in this certain space of time, when this is played, you know, eight times, this thing is only played five and a half. They might truncate something, you know, or right. add something to it to make it fit into that four four. Because a lot of what Meshuggah plays is four four. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of the stuff going on around it isn't. But I mean, if you listen to the drums, especially with anything they've done in the last 10 years, most of what Meshuggah writes, you can pretty much tap your foot to it front to back. It's yeah. all, the, all, the, all the accents and all the riffage around it are in different meters. Yeah. You know? Um, they're still the best at it. There's nobody better than them. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, they are a, uh, I guess you could say, pioneers in yeah. that way. I mean, there's I mean, so many people I know that just are in so many different styles of metal. Where they wouldn't even want to like have anything to do with this other style of metal, whatever you know, maybe it's sort of elitism, sort of mentality or whatever. But everybody can come around something like Mashuga, you know, or even like uh, another band that kind of is like they like Misfits or something. You know, there's just sure. bands that everybody can kind of agree on, even when they like you know the well, guy in the other style style of metal is kind of like their moral enemy. Well, that's and that's the funny thing too is that I was I was kind of an oddball. As far as the music thing went too, because I didn't realize that there was this kind of like there's this like this warfare between punk guys and metal guys, and I didn't know what it was because not only did I love listening to Metallica and Anthrax and all this other you know really heavy nasty shit, but I am an enormous fan of bands like Ten Foot Pole, you know Pennywise, Pulley, 
freaking yeah you know lag wagon um and for anyone listening also i mean just keep this one in mind if you like melodic speed punk you know strung out stuff like that the single best band in the entire world is a is a band you've never heard of from italy and they're called beer bong they are fucking amazing stellar drummer great musicians um if you like your if you like your punk rock fast and like fun to listen to that band is the shit. They are awesome. Beer bong. Beer bong. I've got. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a ton of a ton of their stuff. Um, it's incredible, man. It stellar. Is that kind of in line with like the that nine those other nineties punk bands you were naming off there? That similar style of punk. Yeah, band? I mean they. Wise and No Effects and stuff like that. Very much. It's just they do. Yeah, like No Effects. If you like No Effects, you love Beer Bong. It, it just and I pissed off every No Effects fan in the world by saying this, but if you like No Effects, you'll love Beer Bong. They're, it's like they're just, in my opinion, they're better. Everything yeah. they do is better. <laughs> cool. You know? Um, and they're fast. It, I mean, their first al album was called Fast and Comfortable. And it's like 14 songs, and I think it's 27 minutes long, you know? Yeah. But it's not because it's for a lack of material. It's because they're playing like 240 BPM, yeah. everything. Yeah. They're just screaming. Yeah, it, it's fast. It's very fast. Yeah, it's... Uh different game when it comes to playing live sets for a punk band, huh? Yeah. It's gotta have a lot more songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I never thought about that. Um, okay, so then, so kind of covered like the high school period for you, which was your big start with guitar, yeah. and then you started getting into like the early 2000s, so you put the guitar down for a little bit, and yeah. you started coming back to it. So then, once you came back to the guitar, you were trying to do like all that remains stuff. Yeah. So what else was happening at that point for you with the, with the instrument? Well, I just, I, I, I got back into writing music. I actually wrote a bunch of music when I was in high school because I was having fun playing the guitar. And once I had fun playing again, I started writing again. So, um, but the, the thing about it is that I wrote for myself. I never showed anybody else my music. I just did it because I enjoyed doing it. You know, I was, I was single and... I'd record stuff and listen to it in my car and think, wow, I created that. That's neat. What was your recording setup? Was it, uh... I used a, uh, well, initially, <laughs> initially, my first actual recordings were my guitar. Um, I would plug it into that PV Rage, and then I, and the headphone jack out, I would plug it into the lining on my PC, not knowing anything about impulses at the time. So it was just getting the DI signal straight from, straight from that amp. And I would record that into a program called Windat, and then I would record drums with a keyboard. I would play the keyboard parts on the drums. And Similar way, just going that direct sort of line into the computer. Yeah, you know, and um, so I would have, and I didn't know, I didn't understand the stereo field at all, you know, so I was just, you know, drums right down the middle, three guitars right down the middle if I wanted to have two tracks and a solo or something like that, or whatever it was, so. Um, I recorded four or five songs that way, and then I, and then I stopped playing. So when you were doing those, and that was still in high school then at that time? You're talking yeah, okay. and, and then I stopped, and then I went to, you know, got a real job, and I did the the, uh, the automotive thing for a long time. But and at that point, you came back to the recording again, you probably had a little mm -hmm. bit more yeah, I, setup well, it was, for recording? It wasn't a better setup, but I had a, uh, I had a little... Crate G, what was it, GLX two twelve, I think, or something at the time. Stuff, yeah. yeah, and I and I basically I lived in an apartment, so I didn't want to piss off my neighbors, so I actually cut a hole in the uh, the freaking like the grating on top of the amp to protect the speakers, and I shoved a little Audix i five mic in there that I had laying around, and I just started recording that instead. And I used a free program called Crystal Audio Engine, very 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 basic, simple multi track. You know, program, um, and I used that for a couple years. And uh, ultimately, what ended up happening was I I had this friend named Kisa, Kiwi, we used to call her, and we were hanging out. And she's like, Dave, she's like, you gotta go meet. She's like, I gotta go to this party out in Harvard. You wanna go with me? I was like, Yeah, cool. So I walk into this house, and Anthrax among the living. That album is playing in this house, and I was like, Holy no shit! Way. I love this party already. At the right place. I'm like, this is great, man. So yeah, I was, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm drinking and meeting people and, and and I'm talking, and the next song that comes on is Eric Clapton, and so I'm like, okay, who's the guitar player here? I said, nobody, nobody puts on Anthrax and then Eric Clapton unless you're playing guitar. Who's the guitar player, you know? And uh, this dude Rick Ricker, he's like, he's like, oh, that's me. He's like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, it's your house. They said, you're the player. He's like, yeah, come check it out. So he goes down to the basement. 
He's got 13 guitars on the wall, drum set in the corner, you know, nice 4x12s and everything else. I'm like, what, is this all yours? He's like, no, he's like, my band practice is here. And I'm like, no kidding, I'm like, you're in a band? He's like, yeah, he's like, we're gonna get drunk and wasted and come down here and jam tonight, you should watch. I'm like, okay. So, I watched everybody go downstairs later on that night and they all, uh, they all had a blast. And I just remember thinking, like, this was so much fun. I'm like, that looked, that looked like a lot of fun. Um, you know, and it, it was neat. So I actually went and saw them play a couple of their own shows. The band was called Vagrancy. Yeah. And uh, I went and watched them play a couple shows, and I had fun. I was like, yeah, I could, I could watch, you know, guys do this. And in the process of watching them, I got to watch other local bands play too. So you hadn't really gone out and seen much at that time? I had then? never seen a local band at all in my life, and huh. I was probably 26, 27 years old at the time. What? So. Um, Crazy. Yeah. He lived under a rock. So I yeah, so but it was cool. Be a little shorter, little yeah, right. <laughs> but to make a long story to summarize that, I got a call from Ricker about six months later. And he was like, Hey Dave, he's like, um, we uh he's like things are kinda changing with my band. He's like, we need a guitar player. Can you can you come and play for us? And I was like, dude, I am totally uninterested. I'm like, I got I'm like, I, I, you know, I've got so much going on, I'm working all the time, I'm hanging out with my friends, I'm not really, I don't really want to be in a band. I'm like, I have a lot of fun watching you guys play, but I have no interest in being in a band. And he was like, well, alright. He's like, well, thanks anyway. He's like, well, if you want to come by and just kind of watch us and stuff or hang out, he's like, anything, you know, feel free. So, he calls me again probably two weeks later and runs, you know, runs it down my throat. He was like, look, he's like, well, just come over and have fun then. When was the last time you played music with anyone? I'm like, well, never really. He's like, well, just bring your guitar and bring your little amp and... You know, he's like, maybe, maybe you'll like it. I'm like, okay, whatever, what's it going to be? So I went down there, and um, we ended up writing a song. <laughs> it was kind of how it happened on the, on, the, on the first time. And he was like, dude, do you want to do this again next week? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I can come back. And it just became, I just kept showing up twice oh, yeah. a week. We were writing music. And it just gradually became you being a member of the Yeah, band. next thing I knew, it's like, hey, man, you want to play a show here? All right, let's do it. So my first show ever was at this it's place like a called Gateway Drug. It was, dude. <laughs> it was. Um, and you know, in, in in between now and then, they you know I, I got convinced to buy you know better gear and stuff. Yeah. So I, I I I had that little crate, but I ended up dropping about three grand on on gear. I you know I bought a tube head. I got a sixty five hundred five plus. And I bought a Marshall Mode Four cab, which is a killer cab for metal. Actually, yeah, you just made like a big jump. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a that's a great metal cabinet too. Really, you know, a lot of moves a lot of air around, so it's got awesome bottom end response. Um, and it's actually got 100 watt versions of uh, vintage 30s in it too. The slushings? Yeah, back? it's got, so or no, there's 75 watt versions of, of a vintage 30. So basically it's like a vintage 30, but it can handle a lot more, yeah. a lot more shit before it, before it breaks up. And it actually made it sound a little cleaner, okay. um, which is cool. But, and then yeah. was, was that that party then? So yeah, actually that party you were at was yeah. the first time you ever saw me play anything. So that wasn't, I guess technically that wasn't my first show, it was in January. My first was in October Okay. at, uh, at Lindsay's place, Lindsay yeah. and, and Rickerson's place. Yeah. That was pretty much how it all got started though, was was Vagrancy. And my, my first actual show at a venue was at this place called DC Cobbs in Woodstock. Yeah, I remember that place. We played there with a band called Westbury, who, you know, they were, they became friends of mine. And that was with Vagrancy again? Yeah, it was Vagrancy, really nice. and uh, there was another band called Who Got a Fix that played with us that day. Remember that name? Who Got a Fix kicked ass. That show was where I met this guy Mike, who introduced me to this dude George, who I ultimately ended up starting a death metal band with in Chicago called Eleonora. And I wrote, we had two demos that we wrote, and st started working on Just some. Over <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> but I wrote two songs with them, and then quit. <laughs> Because in the process of getting interested in local music big time and seeing what else was out there, it was really beneficial for me to get dragged into Chicago's music like that and get introduced to people like George and, and all the other you know people I was working with. Because I ultimately ended up meeting, seeing a band called In Cinema. Yeah. I N N. Well, so they were already a band before you joined. They were a band before I joined. Yeah. And this is what about 27, 28 still around that age. Or? I was. This was still 2008. Now. Okay. You know? Actually, it might have been. Yeah, it was 2008. I think. Okay. And I remember seeing these guys play at Penny Road Pub. I don't know how they got dragged out to Penny Road Pub, but they were opening they up. Did somehow. They opened up for for this band called Pugatafix, Puga and um, 
I remember watching them play and watching primarily their base. I mean, everyone was so good. Mm -hmm. Everyone was just so freaking good at what they did. Their guitar player was was just solid. The singer was he was performing. It was the first time I saw a local band perform. Like this guy knew what he was doing. He could play the guitar. He wore it. Guitar. He wore it right. He could sing his ass off. But he was like, they were so fun to watch on stage. And I remember thinking like, this band needs to be fucking huge because the music was awesome, and um, they just blew me away. And I fell in love with that band from the from the get go. So I found out the next time they were playing, I went and saw them again. I grabbed one of their demos that they were handing out for free, and basically I made it to every show that they were playing. Like if in cinema was playing somewhere, I would go, and so they just knew me as Dave, who was like always showing up at their shows. Yeah, yeah. And um, basically, after kind of a long story short, but their guitar player Jay, who is a he's a badass in his own right, um, and a really really good guy, just decided he needed to make some lifestyle changes, and he ended up moving to West Virginia. And now he's a coal miner. <laughs> Talk about life still changes, okay? Yeah, <laughs> but it it opened up a uh, it opened up a spot in that band, and because they because I was kind of gotten to knowing everybody, um, their bass player Adam gave me a call, and I was actually on a date in in, in Chicago at this place called Cafe Twenty Eight, um, but it was really good Cuban food actually. I don't think it's around anymore, and uh, I remember getting a phone call from him, and I, I talked to I talked to this uh, my girlfriend at the time. Megan was her name. I talked to Megan and I said, "Hey, I gotta take this call." She's like, "Really?" I said, "I said it's Adam from In Cinema." She's like, "Oh, well, answer it." <laughs> and so I did. And he basically said, "He's like, hey, Dave. He's like, uh, he's like, I don't know what you're doing or what your schedule looks like, but basically, he's like, J Dog moved away, and um, we need a guitar player." He's like, "I need a guitar player for In Cinema." He's like, "You play guitar, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, do you want to come try out?" And I, I like almost crapped myself. I was like, "Yeah, man." He's like, okay, well, you know, learn the, learn the songs on the demo, and um, we'll get together on like whatever night it was on, on this night, and uh, you know, they practice in a storage unit. And, uh, it, it was a storage, a heated storage unit. <laughs> and so I showed up there with all my gear and everything, and I played the songs, and they just said they just never they never tried anybody out. They were like, okay, well, here, listen to these demos, learn learn these parts, and so I learned the whole set, and um, I think three weeks later I played my first show with them. It was in June of that year, June of 2008. So it was the third time I was ever on stage, it was June of 08. And I played at this place called Tiger O'Styles in Berwyn, Illinois with uh, Janice, who ended up going on doing big things for a while. I played with them, a band called Nothing Forgotten, and a band called Underfed. And like, if I, if, <laughs> if those three bands, if Underfed, Nothing Forgotten, and uh, uh, and Janice <laughs> played a local show in Chicago today. They'd probably sell out yeah. any of the major venues they wanted to play at. That would be awesome. But that was really cool because, like, now I was I was, I was on stage with, with bands that were put together, and they were paying for production on their recordings, and they were they knew what they were doing, and they had pro gear, and they were all performing, and it was like it, it just totally made me a better musician. Set a good example. Yeah. yeah, and a better songwriter too. That was. The best thing about being in local music for me was was getting an opportunity to listen to bands that weren't copycatting everything on the radio. Because that's all the radio music is, is a copy of other shit that worked out well. Mm -hmm. You know? These are guys that are just doing what they want and they're doing it well. And I was like, man. So I fell in love with the Chicago music scene. And I ended up spending probably two to three nights a week out there, even if I wasn't playing, just seeing other bands and networking, meeting other people, promoting, you know, I was big on promotion in person, so I would, if we had a show in Chicago somewhere, I would go to that venue at least twice a month, and I would be handing out CDs with the show date on them, you know, yeah. and so like... And I get the, the impression that you are the perfect person to have in a band when it comes to promotion stuff. <laughs> well, I was, again, I was in a different, I was in a different point though, because I was, a lot of people the one, the one sad thing is that music doesn't pay shit. It, it really is a difficult industry to make a dime in. And at the local level, it's never going to pay you anything, yeah. really. So I, I found that I was one of the few people in the Chicago music scene that, that actually had a, a, a legitimate career and was able to make this the thing for the side. Everybody else was you know, working at Guitar Center or right. holding down small retail jobs. So I, was, I felt like I was one of the only people in, the, in that was doing that that actually kind of had money to throw around because I didn't really have any other obligations.
So it was easy for me to go buy CDs and spend time in Chicago and you know blow money at bars and stuff like that. Promoting was, was easier for me because I actually had the finances to do it, maybe. I think that makes it harder if you're flat broke and most musicians are. <laughs> That's why so. I got into teaching, man. Yeah. I mean, I ended up loving it, but uh, initially it was because like I need something more than what I was working at Guitar Center for a period there, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, sucks, man, you know. I mean, there were some people that might make a decent pay, but that job is not for everybody, and mm -hmm. you know, so I just needed something. And uh, and mechanics, that's what you were doing. Yeah, right? I was an auto tech and for 10 years. You were making pretty good dough with that. Yeah, yeah, so, I made great money doing that. Yeah, so um, and something that you loved at the same time, right? Yeah, I mean, and I, and, it, and that, I guess it was a good thing I did it because it gave me the money to to do what I wanted to on a local scene. And that was that was really when I started improving as a songwriter. I think was when I was was when I started playing with other people, especially especially with In Cinema. And nothing against any of the other musicians I worked with in the past, but In Cinema was doing something different. It's raised, kind of raised the bar. And that was and that was ninety percent Rashid. He has such a unique. I mean, he's it's like a fingerprint. When I when I hear music. If it's his print on it, and I can I can pick out something he wrote without knowing he wrote it, just because it's very. I've never heard anyone that writes music like he does. He's just got a very unique, original feel to it. It's just different, and it's awesome. So, what ways did your music, your songwriting, improve that? What would you say was different before you had this sort of? Uh, it just kind of. It, it's I don't know. I never. The, I guess the thing is that I could say. I never really corrected things like when I, as I developed as a songwriter. Not that I think I'm a great songwriter or anything. And it's I'm such just, a subjective thing too. It's too yeah. hard to say. I like what I write, right. but I, don't, I mean, if, if nobody else likes it, I don't really care. Right. I mean, if they do, then that's awesome. But yeah. if they don't, I wrote it. I really wrote it for myself. And if somebody else enjoys it, then that's like a bonus. Um, but I have fun listening to music, and if I can write something I have fun listening to, then that's awesome. And what I learned was just, you know, instead of not doing things I used to do, writing music, I was just adding new ideas and new concepts. You know, Rashid really taught me how to slow down and add melody to a lot of things that I never did before. Um, I don't know if he knows that, but it's the case. It's just kind of like you guys were working together, and you would give suggestions, and then you would kind of see that there was like a common thread between these suggestions. Mm -hmm. And then they were just things that you started and like, kind of like understanding, like, oh, okay, I understand yeah. the purpose of that. And, and it wasn't even like suggestions. Like, the, the cool thing about, about writing within cinema is that I would just, I would write a song from front to back, and then the people, and then they would listen to it, and they was like, yeah. And then Rashi would be like, I got an idea for this instead. You know, and we'd get back together next practice, and he would start, you know, pounding out a different riff or something like that, or, you know, the drummer would listen to it, and he would come up with a totally different pattern. And by the time that it was done, everyone had their input on it, and it was a better song than yeah. what I had brought to the table. And probably things that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. Never would have thought yeah, of on your own. That, that's, but that's why I like working with most personally when it comes to songwriting, people that come up with something that I would have never thought of. That's yeah. the most fun. It is. Or I mean, it, it, but still sounds great. And another thing that I always took for granted was was the drummer's input. You know, until I started working with like really really good drummers, and, and you know Tony. Uh, Tony is a stellar. He's just another one of those guys that's a, a class drummer. He is so much better than Tony on the local scene. Still would have, would have drummed circles around probably ninety percent of the people that I've toured with. You know, whether it was bands that opened for us or headline or whatever. I mean, I was on tour with a lot of bands. Yeah, and Tony was sure. a better drummer than almost all of them. Huh. You know, he was just he's great. Well, and, so Rashid was is still in non point. Yeah, but and so was Adam. Um, Adam, the the bass player from um, from In Cinema. Oh, I, I didn't brought, know that he was in In Cinema too. Yeah, okay. I was. It's yeah. I mean, it, to make a long story short, um, and I guess I don't know. I don't want to get too in depth because I don't want to talk about things that I probably. I, I don't want to talk about things without the other band without the band's permission. Sure. Because I don't want to piss off certain controlling factors in there. Because uh, who knows? I maybe they're listening to every word I say. But to summarize, I. I was referred to Rob, the drummer, um, who is also a sick drummer in his own right. He doesn't give himself enough credit, you know, because he, but he's he's a very very tight, solid drummer, and he's got a good ear for things that work too. It was I had a lot of fun working with Rob. Um, kind of forgot where I was going with this. Oh yeah, he basically transitioned. Yeah, basically he got a hold of me, and. Um, 
he got a hold of me through uh, my friend Jody, who was a singer for a band called Losing Scarlet, and somehow they knew each other. And he said that he was looking for looking to collaborate with somebody from Chicago that didn't have, that knew how to play guitar, knew how to perform on stage, knew how to write music, and wasn't like a like an ego dick. Yeah. You know. And I guess my name came up, and so he reached out to me through email, and asked if I'd be interested in working with him. And I was like, holy crap, man, this is like a real musician and a real band that wants to work with me on something. That's kind of neat. So I sent him some some song ideas that I that I had recently written, and um. He really said, "Hey, man, I want to work with you on this. You know, this is really cool. Do you want to, you want to get a side gig, a side thing going?" And I thought about it, and I'm like, "You know, I, I basically said, look, I got a girlfriend. I've got, um, you know, this band. I've got a full time job. I said, I really don't think I have enough time to dedicate to a musician of your caliber." So just to clarify, he wasn't not playing at that time. Yeah, and had been for a while. Yeah, and this was a side project that he was looking to get going. Yeah, you know, and I guess I don't know, it, you know. Rob, if you're listening, correct me if you want. Um, it, it sounds like he might have been under the impression that Nonpoint as a band was not really going in anywhere. And I, I think he kind of was expecting it to maybe fizzle out yeah. because they had released an album a few years before that that really did not have any commercial success. And um, I mean, no, I guess that's not true. Commercially, it was successful, but the fans did not did not like it that much at all. It, it's Pretty much uh, just exploring other opportunities. Yeah, and they it was their first. Open. Yeah, and it was their first uh, album with a with a new guitar player. It was this guy named Zach, who actually was a local Chicago musician too. Ironically, it just it didn't work out, and I, I think there were some serious personality conflicts with that lineup. So um, initially, I think that Rob just kind of thought that the band was gonna maybe not last much longer, and he was looking for something new to start. But when he heard those demos. After I told him I didn't really want to do anything on the side, he said, "Well, what if?" Um, he said, "What if I told you that I, I know about this band? That uh, you know, they're they're basically he's like they're established. They've been around for a long time. They've got five albums out. They've um, you know they tour in a bus. They're kind of a he's like basically it would be your job. He's like and he's like I think they're going to need a guitar player, but I'm not sure if their guitar player knows it yet. He's like, would you be interested in something like that?" And I said, well, yeah, that sounds like a totally different story, you know? Um, and then... It's a big jump. Yeah, he's like, okay, let me, uh, let me go talk to them and see if they'd be interested, you know? He's like, he's like, is it okay if I play your demos for them? And I said, absolutely. And uh, later on, about, about a week or two later, I got more emails back from him. And it was the music that I had written, but it had been chopped up and kind of reorganized a little bit, and there were vocals on it. And I'm like, I know those vocals. Yeah. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, holy shit, this guy wants me in Nonpoint. You know? oh, so you didn't have any idea that the band was? I had no idea that he wanted me in that band. Yeah. You know, I thought it was some other band. I asked him, I was like, have I heard the band's name before? He's like, oh yeah. He's like, you, you've heard of them. Yeah. I'm like, okay. The funny thing was I was never a Nonpoint fan just because I never really listened to the music. Yeah. I, recognized, I recognized a couple of the songs, but it's one of those bands I never really gave a chance. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was a really weird feeling when I realized what was going on. I was like, oh my god. Um, the, the guitar player that they were having issues with was very close to the bass player in the band. His name was Ken. And um, basically after, well, again, the way I understand the story, because to an extent that's all hearsay, I guess I wasn't there for any of this. Um, they basically told Zach that they were bringing another guitar player in and um, you know deal with it there's another guitar player coming in right. you know but they didn't actually can him or anything like that, from what I understand I guess it just naturally fell apart yeah um, because he said he didn't want to work with another guitar player and they said well you can work with him or you can not work with him if you know what we mean right and so ended up not working with him <laughs> and you know, because they, he was tied with the bass player, the bass player ended up stepping out as well. Uh -huh. So now they bring a new guitar player in, and now there's a hole where the bass was at. And I said to Rob, I said, you know, the band that I came from, I'm like, you know, is actually a lot better at what they do than I am at what I do. I said, if, if you're if you're happy with the music that I'm writing and everything, I'm like, you should maybe really sincerely look at Adam because he's a he's a kick-ass bass player, mm -hmm. and the guy can throw down on stage. He's an animal on stage. You know, oh really? 
And I said, yeah. And I said, you know, I said, for what it's worth. And they said, can you do backups? And I said, I probably could, but I really don't want to. I said, but, you know, the singer for my band is a killer guitar player and an awesome songwriter, too, and he can sing his ass off. Yeah. So, you know, and Rob's answer was like, oh, my God, I've always wanted two guitar players in this band. So that's pretty much what happened is after, after I joined Nonpoint a couple, a couple months later, I got Adam and Rashid in with me. And the rest is kind of history, if anyone knows how that went. So, so um, just real quick, because that's pretty much... Uh Pretty much to the point I wanted to get, you know, mm -hmm. like, but everything before the career of music, everything yeah. that led up to that, right? But then, real quick though, along the way of being in Nonpoint, I'm sure you were in a totally different situation than what you were used to. Mm -hmm. So, what things did you get out of that that improved your skills as a guitar player? Touring? Did, yeah, touring, the oh, recording man. process. I mean, I'm sure you the, had the some one good thing, experiences there. Well, I mean, A, the, the, the best thing about touring is that every single night you are going to be on stage with other musicians yeah. that are really good at what they do. Doing it all the you time. Know? And you're doing it every single night. You know, We would play six shows a night, like every week pretty much. So being on stage over and over again, it just makes it more, Terrible. it just becomes more habitual. You do it without thinking about it. And you know? doing the same thing. Too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it teaches you how to play with a band. One thing I, that, that I still love about Nonpoint, and I think not many other bands can say, especially in today's day and age, is when you see Nonpoint live, you're not, whether it's with me or the new lineup or the old lineup, you're not getting any, any bullshit. There's no click track, there's no backing tracks, there's no, there's nothing to fall back on. What you're hearing is five guys on stage doing what they do with no help at all, you know? And that's it. I mean, if something's out of tune, you'll hear it. If the safe Elias sings off key, you'll hear it. If Rob misses a beat, you'll hear it. If your guitar, if you miss a note, everyone's gonna hear it. Um, we did, we never relied on any kind of bogus BS and and just to pop everyone's bubble. If you really really like a band, you're probably and you see them live, you'd be blown away if you knew how much what of what you're hearing is probably not actually being played. It's like. It's scary. Yeah. <laughs> it's really scary. So, I mean, they get up and they do it every night, and they throw down. They they they're awesome, you know. So that's what the thing I got the most as a musician out of being on stage every night was just how to become a solid performer. You know, it really took all the chaos on stage that I was doing when I was locally, and it I think it just became more structured, and I just became a better I just became a better band member. You know? So would you say that like your skills? Did it need to progress as much with what you could do, but just doing it better? Yeah. Actually, I, the, the weird thing about it, I probably became a worse guitar player because of that situation, because the, most of the music that I played in that band was not nearly as challenging as the music that I liked to play, okay. you know? Um, I, 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 to be honest, the self-titled Nonpoint album is probably far and away the most comp hard to play Nonpoint album out there. And a lot of it was because, you know, half the music on there was music that I wrote back in the mid-2000s. Yeah. You know, it was, it was weird hearing stuff end up on a radio and end up on a CD, and these were riffs that I wrote, you know, six years beforehand. That's bad. So that was really, that was really weird. Little did you know at that time? No idea. Where these riffs would be going. Mm -hmm. That's still probably the most difficult album to play front to back. That's a, that's a, fun, that's a fun thought, because that could be anybody. You know, they have no idea. They're just sitting down playing on their own, and they have no idea where this could end up. I mean, you just never know. Yeah, it's weird. I hope someday the record labels and everybody else involved gets their heads out of their asses and actually lets me release the demos because I released a demo that ended up on the album once, and within 24 hours the record label was on the horn. Um, their old manager was on the horn saying, "You got to pull this down. They're going to sue you because yeah. you're, you know." I'm like this. I'm like this isn't the album. I'm like I, I recorded this in my living room with a freaking guitar and a, and a computer. Essentially, you know? it's your thing, right? Yeah. I'm like there are riffs in this song that in this demo that aren't even on the album. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Everything is different. Yeah. And they said it doesn't matter once once the once the label owns the song, they own everything related to that song. It's not worth dealing with. You know. Yeah. So I had to pull it down right afterwards, but. I remember that because uh, I think it's a Facebook post or something like that. Yeah. Well, we're we're getting close to the uh, to the hour, and uh, it's also getting late for you, I know too. So, uh, but real quick, I wanted to go over a couple other things. Yeah. So I know that you didn't know like the theory side of things, 
I still don't. I still don't. The only thing I think I know how to do, and I'm probably still shitty at it, is count time. And I would, I would, I would credit Miss Sugar for that yeah. entirely. Just from you your know. listening experience, you kind of pick up on that. Yeah, you know. What was your thoughts on theory? Was it something that you did want to know how to do, and you just never got around to it, or something that you just never had put much? Um, it's you never cared much about, or I never cared. I never cared enough about it to put time into it. Okay. I always, I was always able to get to do what I wanted without it, and so I never saw a reason to invest the time in it. Okay. Now, you know, looking that back, it was very foolish because I probably, I, I would probably be a much better musician, songwriter, and guitar player had I taken the time to learn those things. But um, so you do kind of look back on it and wish that maybe. Oh you're yeah. That. Is that Definitely. more for your own like? personal desire to just know more? Absolutely. So you still don't think though that it would have helped you to do more or? No, I know it would have. Okay. My, my lack of understanding has absolutely been a hindrance to me. You know, I've just, I've just pushed through it on my own because, okay. you know. Did you get some examples of that? Like maybe if you had known this, it would have helped you in that situation or just too many small examples to really pinpoint one? No. I. I I think it's, it would be, I don't even know if there's any, any single example that would make sense. It, it just kind of like, um, knowing more about something will very infrequently be a bad thing, you know? So like, if you, if you build houses for a living, you know, you're probably going to be really good at it if that's what you've been doing for the last 10 years, you know? Um, but you can still learn little tricks and things, you know, from other people here and there that would benefit you despite how long you've been doing it. And I think that, I think that the, the theory side, the school side, learning how to read music and knowing, you know, anything like that is, is uh, it's, it's definitely a benefit. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're in a position to where you can benefit from the application of that knowledge, then it's probably uh, a good thing for you, you know. No, knowing because I, I mean there's a thing there's a lot of people that I know that know how to read music and they know theory inside and out and guess what they don't give a fuck about music yeah. so what good does it do them it's all about whether or not you're going to get something out of the application yeah so uh, yeah out, out of applying that knowledge and that's kind of the same thing if I had the knowledge I would apply it to what I do and it would probably result in a better outcome you know a better product because it's one of those interesting topics and there's you know a lot of this stuff comes up online because it's the easy place to discuss these types of things but you see and, and I hear it from just people I talk to that are the guitar players that I know or students um, that come to me with prior experience saying they never learned theory or whatever mm -hmm. um, but you know it's one of those things where a lot of people really are against theory they really don't like the idea of theory. They feel like it's going to put a hindrance on them. and They don't see how it's going to help them, but they also fear that it's going to hurt them, too. No, I think that's really foolish. That's that's my thought, too. Yeah. I'm trying to keep mostly my opinions out of this. But, um, but at the same time, you were able to still pull it off and obviously do things that a lot of guitar players would aspire to do as far as you know being in a band that was as active as Nonpoint was sure. and stuff, and you did not absolutely need it. I'll tell you this though. I mean, to 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 put things into perspective though, Rashid is one of the single strongest musical influences I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. And that guy doesn't know how to read music. He doesn't know how to write music. Like he knows how to write music, but he doesn't know how to write it down. You know, yeah. he doesn't know theory. He doesn't know modes scales or scales or any of that crap. He just writes what he feels, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Adam is pretty much the same story. Rob, the drummer. I don't think that guy knows anything about music really, but he can play guitar. He's actually a pretty good guitar player. Yeah. Rob actually wrote, Rob wrote a handful of songs on the last two albums that I wrote with Nonpoint. You know, he wrote. He was a major contributor to the to the songwriting process. So, but he he'd be in the same boat. He has no idea. You show him, you show him, you know, right. sheet music, and it might as well be Arabic. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and I'm not like a great sheet music reader myself either. I, I've learned to read it because I used it for certain things. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't sight read or anything. I could sit down and figure it out, but I can't just play what I see, you know. But all the other side, sides of theory, like the scales and what chords go with what scales and everything. See, what's interesting to me about talking with people like, like yourself that didn't really do that stuff or know that stuff um, is that I just look at that, like I was saying with like the Metallica when we were talking about that, and, you know, I need the book. You know, I need a teacher to tell me this is a hammer on, this is a pull off and stuff. And I just think about like all the things that it helped me with so much and mm -hmm. how much I, I 
think I would have felt, and I know I did feel lost, because I didn't know it at one time, and I realized I was missing something, and that there's other people out there that, even if they don't know the theory, they still just, just doing fine without it, and how much I felt like I needed it. So it's really interesting to yeah. me. I, I wish... It doesn't mean that you're not going to be good if you don't learn theory. It doesn't mean that it's going to hurt you if you do learn theory. It's just it's different approaches, and I think it's interesting to explore. The only time I think theory is going to hurt someone is if it's forced down their throat early into their musical... You know, like, the, the, the path that they're walking down, you know? Mm -hmm. The reason that I ended up where I did as a musician was because no one ever shoved shoved it down my throat. No one ever made it work for me. I was playing guitar because I was having fun playing music I liked to listen to. Mm -hmm. That was fun for me. Right. You know, if if I go to a, you know, if I had gone to take guitar lessons and the guy said, okay, hey, I'm really, really happy that you want to learn this album, but first, I want you to, I want you to, you know, practice these, these, you know, finger positions and tell me what chords they are. After. I mean, it's just, it's like going to school. It yeah. takes all the fun out of it and it makes it a, it makes it a, a task. Yeah. You know? Which brings me to my next thing with the lessons. So you did, which is a really interesting connection because you are actually the sole reason that I found Tom Hess. Okay. Um, even though we didn't know each other at the time, just because I was friends with your brother, and he got to Tom because of you, yeah. and Tom has played such a huge role in so many ways in my life with so many different things beyond just my guitar playing skills, yeah. which he helped a lot with. Um, and uh, you took a couple lessons. You said I think it was two. literally two lessons. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, and then Jake had been with him, your younger brother, for a little bit longer after you had taken those lessons. He got introduced to him, and then Jake introduced me to him when I saw Jake getting better than me when I had been playing guitar longer than him. Yeah, and I'm like, dude, I know you're smart and everything, but like I've been playing guitar way longer. How the heck are you getting better? He's like, oh, I got this cool teacher, blah blah. blah. So I went to study with him. Yeah. So that was that little that little circle of events there. Um, so. As far as lessons go, you obviously wanted to start trying, figuring out that path because you did a couple lessons. Yeah. What were your thoughts at the time that you were trying to get into that? Well, because I, I felt like I hit a roadblock where I kind of plateaued. Okay. You know, like I was like I, I was just developing and developing and developing, and all of a sudden I can't play anymore. And and it's for anyone listening, it's not like you don't get good things out of lessons. I had been playing really aggressively throughout high school now for probably about three or four years, and I felt like in the last year I hadn't gone anywhere. So I went and saw this dude named Tom on a recommendation from a buddy of mine, and I had two lessons with him, and uh, the first time I sat down, he didn't even care about anything. He was like, well, just, just play for me. Show me what you do. And so I played a bunch of, you know, stuff. He was like, okay, play leads for me now. And so I played a bunch of leads, and probably the single most important thing that he, that he fixed on me right then and there is he's like, you don't use your pinky nearly enough. He's like, that thing is really important. He's like, start using your pinky. I'll give you some exercises. Yeah. Pinky. yeah. Yeah. With the pinky pointing straight out. Yep. <laughs> so he gave me some exercises and, and, and just told me which fingers to use on which frets and uh, and so on and so forth. And that probably was the single most important piece of advice I got from him out of my two lessons. Yeah. Because now I use my pinky like crazy and I, I probably wouldn't have ever done that without without someone who knows what I was doing wrong yeah. to show me that. Yeah. You know? And then there's probably a million things I'm still doing wrong, you know. That's why my brother is Ten times better guitar player than I am. And you also said that he gave you some uh, scales too. Yeah, I I don't remember. The funny thing about it is that I I never knew what a scale was, but once I started playing them, it was very easy for me to figure out you the rest of the them. sounds or something. Yeah, it just if it sounds like it's in the right. Yeah, I mean you can just tell if it sounds right or not. Right, right. You know. Mm -hmm. And then over the kind of chord progressions and over the kind of chord changes you want, I don't know why I've just never had an issue determining which is the right or wrong note to play. And you didn't, I mean, I'm sure you hit some wrong notes before you discovered which the right note were. Oh, was. yeah. But what about when you're changing keys, now everything is shifted on the fretboard totally different. Did you pretty much just end up kind of like finding scale shapes and realizing without ever having to like even look at it on a sheet and just realizing when these notes sound good together, it kind of makes the shape and you can yeah. move it up and down. Yeah, to an extent. The other thing is that, I mean, I still don't know the fretboard, you know? I really don't. I'm not good. I am I am absolutely useless in a freestyle environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it takes me... Songwriting for me happens very quickly, but if you told me to play... Yeah, hey, they We're just jamming yeah, or something. Yeah, you want me to get in a room and jam like a bunch of hippies, I will look like the single worst musician on the planet because I just... 
I really need to be, I need to know what I'm doing musically before I do it. Okay. Very infrequently can I improvise and it will sound well. Gotcha. So I have to know what I'm, what I'm playing. Right. Once the muscle memory is there, I don't have to look. I can, you know, I can play an entire show without looking at my guitar probably. Yeah. But it's only because I've done it a zillion times in the past. Right. Um, so for me, I learn when I mean I, I like to write a lot of weird things, and I'll write a lot of interesting key changes. But when it comes times to write harmonies and melodies, those take me a lot longer than they should, because what I'm hearing in my head takes a long time for me to figure out on the fretboard. Right, right. You know, and uh, like I will spend, I'll spend a couple hours recording and tracking a song, and I will spend the rest of the day on the solo. Just because I don't are you know. writing it then, yeah. or are you kind of like improvising something and then just taking little pieces of that, or yeah. how do you approach that? A lot of it. I mean, as weird as it sounds, a lot of my a lot of leads I write by whistling. Uh, I'll like whistle okay. or I'll hum. So I'll have a thing going in the background, and I'll just kind of like whistle and hum shit that naturally comes out, and I'll, then I'll put it down the guitar. Yeah. I'll just figure out what I need to do to make those make those sounds come out. Yeah. So just like with like the songwriting from the beginning, you're hearing something in your head and you're just trying to work out that those sounds on the guitar. And Usually I'll start most of. Yeah, when I when I write, basically I find a riff that I like. I'll just keep screwing around with something until I until I come up with a new riff that I like. And once I've kind of got that riff tweaked into something that I think is worth working on, I'll just build off around it. I'll build another riff behind it, and then I'll build another riff behind that, and then maybe that riff sounds better in front of the first one that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll make an acoustic version of it, or maybe I'll do some whatever. I, I don't really know. There's not like a, a formula that I use when I write, but right. it usually just starts off with me riffing, and then I'll find something that I like, and I'll record it, and I'll build off of that. And and, but that's the nice thing is that you have that technology there to where you can sit down, you can record it. That's one of the things that... I emphasize to my students a lot and that I think will come through in these interviews if you listen from interview to interview is that because like the last guy I interviewed Kyle Kalczewski he uh, had that same setup you know he okay. had a recording setup real basic real yeah. simple you know but it was enough for him to lay something down so that way he could try other layers over that and then just keep doing that you know and really learning of it it'd be being able to sit back and just listen to what you played without having to play it mm -hmm. you look at it differently or being able to just kind of like, either like you said, whistle over it, right? Because yeah. maybe you can't do those two things or just don't want to while at the same time while you're playing guitar. And That's it, difficult, man. It can be difficult yeah. and uh, and when you lay it down, you don't have to worry about playing it and now you can just listen. So I just think that the technology is a really important part of the learning process. Oh, it's huge. It should be really tr people should try and utilize that as many ways as they can. Tri trial by fire is a very effective way to learn anything. You know, um, you you learn from your mistakes pretty quickly too when you're teaching yourself. As long as you as long as you can realize that something is a mistake. And the recording helps. Yeah. You can listen back to it. Yeah. And realize, oh, that didn't like. I've had times where somebody was playing something and I would record it just randomly. You know, they didn't even know I was recording it. And I have them listen back to it, and they'll be like, like in the next week even, be like, what is that? That sounds horrible. And I'm like, well, that's you playing last week. What do you think was bad about it? Yeah. And they're like, oh, like I need, like that needs to be like this or like that, you know? And then they're like, they now realize what they actually need to fix because they could actually hear the problem. So they just weren't aware of the problem. <laughs> so it's, yeah, the recording thing's really cool. It is. Um, getting back to the lessons thing real quick, what, uh, you stopped though, right? You had you were just kind of busy with things or something. Yeah, for me it was a time constraint. I just I was so busy at work and I, I was always had something else going on with my friends, so I didn't I didn't I didn't give I didn't give lessons the kind of time they really deserved. And then you just never got back into it. Yeah. Well, a lot of it too was because I had to live on my own. That was the other deal. When I started taking lessons with Tom, I was still living with I was still living at home with my mom because I was I was young. But when she moved to Vegas, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And so I really had to start working full time and hunker down and find a place to live, and right. it was just kind of bad timing for me. Right, right. But you would have con continued, probably. You think? Probably, yeah. Right. I sh I really wish I I really wish I would have. And at this point in my life, I I almost don't see any reason to, um, because I feel like I'm, I'm like that 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 you know crappy old guy that just refuses to change his ways, you know, and <laughs> the old dog now. Yeah, pretty much. But. Um, who knows? I mean, I, I know I know that I would probably write much cooler stuff if I knew if I knew what I was doing on paper. Yeah. I just don't. Um, you know? Well, I don't uh, don't want to take up any more of your time. 
Uh, it okay. seems like dinner's on the way here. <laughs> but uh, the last thing I just want to know, like, what are you gonna? How is music gonna play a role in your part, or how play a part in your life now? Well, I still, I mean, anyone, you know, if for yeah, for anyone who's bored, I guess, if you Google the word cheese bone, you'll probably, yeah, all one word, cheese bone. Um, I, I, do a, I still write and record a lot of music on my own in my yeah. spare time, when I have spare time, and I haven't had much lately. But I have a, a little Bandcamp page with probably 10 songs on it, you know. I think you can download everything for free from there anyway, so. So it's like a donation optional thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, donate if you want. I think I've got a SoundCloud page with some other random stuff on there, and may, maybe some other stuff, but um, I, I, I plan on continuing writing and recording. I think it's very important to me. It kind of shapes, makes me who I am. And, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and I, if you tried to make it disappear or go away, it probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, yeah, I mean, there's... It's still huge, and obviously I'll still always be listening for new influences. Um, well, now you're in Denver, so how does that play a role? Are oh, like looking, locally? Get, yeah, you think you get. I've only had to check music. I mean, Mister, I didn't go see live music until I was 26. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that that's something that'll come back? It's oh well, you? yeah, I would love it to. As long as it's probably going to be a year or two before I can really start putting any time into sure, it, you know. Sure. Uh, again, just but, get settled in here. Yeah, there's a lot of because of what I do for a living now. There's a lot of there's a lot of it, it's a, it's a it's a process. Yeah. So, um, but it, I mean it's it is very important for me to keep it in my life. And on top of that, you know my my although my touring is probably over, I'm not done being on stage for sure yet. That's I actually I, was ask you. I actually I mean I don't know. I, I guess it depends who you ask. But for all intents and purposes, I'm kind of in tap root right now. That's right. So um, you gotta just, sit in on some t on some shows and stuff here and there, right? Yeah, but it's been a year. I've only played one show for them, and it was a okay. year ago. Okay. I guess the idea is that occasionally they might get offers for some festivals in here and there, and yeah. if, if if they can do it, then then I'll be their guy. That's right. pretty much the agreement we made. Is that if they need if they need me on stage, I'll be there for them. And the work you're doing now gives you the flexibility to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I'm kind of my own boss, which is pretty awesome. awesome. So very cool. Very cool. Um, so that's cool, and I mean, cheese bone, cheese yeah. bone on Bandcamp. Yeah, that's that's all good stuff. Have fun, critique it. There's no lyrics, so it's, it's yeah, it's uh, instrumental metal. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's, it's, a, it's cheese bone in a way, though. Yeah, cheese bone. That music is basically what naturally comes out of me. You know, that's me not writing for a band or writing for a purpose. It's me just writing for for the hell of it, right. and. Um, that is really the culmination of my favorite influences. If you can combine, you know, Metallica with Meshuggah, with All That Remains, and as weird as it sounds, probably the single biggest component in all of those is a band that most likely no one else here has listened to either. Beerbong. No, Extol. <laughs> I mean, Beerbong is an influence for me too, but Extol is That's a band. There. I didn't even realize that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Extol is a band from Norway, okay. and the so you no, know, that's one strike against them for the American crowd because they never really have much chance to be exposed to that. The other strike against them, you know, and I, I'm I'm saying that you know in quotes strike is that they're a Christian band. Mm. You know, a lot of Christian metal bands get shit on because they're Christian bands. Yeah, I I would ask anyone to give this band. 10 minutes of their time and tell me if they care what religion or what they're singing about. Yeah. It is the single, of all the bands that have had an impact on my songwriting, not a single one has been a bigger influence than Extol. Cool. I mean, we pretty much covered uh, covered all the stuff uh, that I can think of, unless you have anything else you want to throw in there. No, man, it's it's cool. It's, it's weird hanging out with basically like my little brother's old buddy. <laughs> it know, was weird walking up. 1100 miles away from, from where you guys, you know, got together. But When you answered the door, it was just like, oh, Jake, but Dave. <laughs> Jake, but not. Did you miss him so much? It was, oh, <laughs> I was just Jake. waiting for you to like show me a yo-yo trip. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jake belongs yeah. here. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. And, Absolutely, uh, dude. I'm always... For anyone, you know, follow me on Facebook. My name is Dave Lizio, L-I-Z-Z-I-O. I mean, everyone is, you know, a lot of a lot of fans of Nonpoint became like pieces of my life. Yeah. You know, I have friends all over the country because of this now. Um, I've 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 been introduced to people that I never would have if it weren't for the music industry, and I've I've it's it's been cool. I mean, I've had people tell me that they've that they've that I was you know a part of their of their. 
influences now. You yeah. know, that's not something I ever expected, and that's like it's a very it's a very humbling thing to to hear because. I mean, whatever. If anyone listened, you got more questions for me. You want to know what you think you might, what's a good thing for your local band, you know, or how do you promote, or what's, uh, whatever. You know, lean on me. That's, I'm, I'm everyone's friend. That's there awesome. are very few people on the planet that I don't get along with. That's awesome. And yeah. thanks again. Sure. And uh, I'm sure I'll see you around. And when you're ready to dive in the music scene or out here, let me know and I can point you in the right direction. Absolutely, dude. Thank you. That concludes the second episode. Thanks for listening. I hope this interview was helpful, insightful, and interesting. I'm really looking forward to the next interview in September. We will have Dave Angstrom of the bands Hermano and Luna Soul as our guest, so be sure to subscribe to the Guitar Power Hour YouTube page and like our Facebook page so you can catch that episode and other future episodes. Dave is just uh, an awesome guitar player, and I love seeing his band Luna Soul live, so uh, can't wait for that one. I want to thank Dave Lizio for being a part of this and sharing his experiences. Be sure to look up his solo project Cheesebone on Bandcamp, as well as his former band Nonpoint, of course, and hit him up on Facebook. Also, if you are in the Denver area and are interested in learning guitar, check out our sponsor's website, rocklifemusicacademy.com, for information on their unique guitar lesson program. Catch you next time.